Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Emma Morton from CRESPD. As part of our short interview series addressing some of our frequently asked questions about psychedelics and bipolar disorder, I'm speaking with another one of our collaborators, Dr. David Gard, Professor of Psychology at San Francisco State University. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, please, can you introduce yourself to our viewers and tell us a little bit more about uh, your role and the kind of work that you do in this area? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so um, I am a, a professor at um, San Francisco State University. I've been there for, I think, 18 years now. Um, and I am the clinical study lead on a project at um, the, the uh, lab at UCSF called Tripper. Um, and we are doing a number of clinical trials there in that lab on psychedelics and the uh, effectiveness of treatment in, in, in a number of different uh, conditions. And the one that I'm the cl clinical study lead for is for um, a study on bipolar two depression and psilocybin. And it's an open la open label study, and we've um, just started uh, running participants in that study right now. That's uh, so exciting, as I understand it. That's a, a world first, so we'll be very interested to hear some updates about that. Um, as, as you are probably familiar, psychedelics like psilocybin containing mushrooms have a long history of use from indigenous medicines and traditions to, you know, we hear a lot about cultural movements in the 1960s, but, you know, it's only now that we're doing the first study of um, psilocybin in bipolar depression. Why does it feel like we're only recently hearing about its potential to treat mental health symptoms? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a couple of major factors that are influencing that. I think one is that, unfortunately, you know, Western medicine is very slow to pick up on advances in indigenous medicines and traditions, and there's a bias there. I think that's one major piece for sure. Um, and then, interestingly, there was a fair amount of research in this area, working with a number of clinical populations in the 1950s and 60s, and I think with the countercultural movement later, um, and sort of the government reaction with uh, classifying these substances as Schedule I drugs, drugs that don't have uh, medical use, um, ended up really shutting down this, this investigation up until the last couple of, well, like last couple of decades, essentially. Um, and that's just been starting to ramp up. And now it, it really is the case that we're really looking more carefully to see how it treats mental health symptoms. And um, yeah, so I think that's a, it's a loss, but I think we're trying to catch up and see what, what can work here. Yeah, it really feels like we're in for an exciting couple of years of um, accelerated developments in this area. Yeah. Um, so do we know how psilocybin works and related to that, how it might be helpful for people with bipolar disorder? Yeah, that's a great question. I think everybody wonders this particular question, of course, wonders about this question. And I remember hearing a psychiatrist talking on the mechanisms of drug action, uh, not just uh, psychedelics or psilocybin, but, um, and, and one of the kind of the, the quotes that they said was something to the effect of, you know, we don't really know how anything works. <laughs> We're really trying to learn a lot of this in, in psychiatry in particular. Um, things work and we find out about it kind of accidentally. Um, so we're, I think there are a number of studies that are going on right now to understand the mechanisms of psilocybin and psychedelics in general. Um, certainly there's some theories around neuroplasticity that the substance itself um, opens up a flexibility in the mind that allows people to make changes that are really crucial. Um, it's also a powerful uh, serotonergic um, as well, or, or psilocybin is, as, as are many of the other psychedelics as well. And so those substances in, in particular may be helpful with depression in bipolar disorder. That's the theory or the idea behind it. I think there's some interesting questions about psychedelic substances in particular because they intersect with psychotherapy. They're not just uh, the question of uh, like, like you would take it in a, um, a substance like an SSRI. Um, you you don't get psychotherapy along with them. You could, but obviously that's not the, the you don't sit while you take the substance, right? Um, and so there's something about the interaction between the psychedelics and the actual psychotherapy assisted aspects uh, to this substance that I think we're just learning as well, which is that it's not just the mechanism of the drug action. So um, that that's another piece of the puzzle here. It's really fascinating. That's really unique. It's different to any kind of... Um medication I've heard about before that both the uh, pharmacotherapy side and the psychotherapy side might be working together in a very unique way. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you know, as I mentioned, you're doing one of the, the world first trials of psilocybin in bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and although, you know, I think myself and other viewers have read a lot in the news lately about psilocybin for depression and trauma, um, we haven't seen much specifically looking into bipolar disorder. Um, can you tell me anything about why that is? Yeah, I think that there's some good reason to be cautious with um, psilocybin and psychedelics in bipolar disorder. And I think a lot of this is anecdotal. There's not a, a, a ton of research that indicates, oh, this is clearly a problem. But the anecdotal evidence, certainly when you think about when people take a psychedelic substance, one of the things that often happens is sleep disruption. And so sleep disruption can be certainly problematic in mania. Um, and also um, symptoms of, of the substance themselves often look like hypomania. And so I think the concerns there are we should be careful about giving a substance that could activate uh, a manic episode for somebody with bipolar disorder. I think the other piece about it is that because it's a powerful uh, serotonergic agent, we know that with some substances, some SSRIs, there's good evidence that you, in the, within the population of people with bipolar disorder, that the serotonergic agents might um, activate a manic episode. Um, and so um, that's, the, that's the concern here, I think, that how it comes together, but it's not really well understood, I guess. Now, I, I know that you wrote a um, paper summarizing some of the case reports that have looked at um, instances where people with bipolar disorder or suspected bipolar disorder have taken psilocybin. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a, a bit about that paper and what you found? Yeah, we went, uh, we went, we decided that because there's not a lot of systematic research on this question, uh, to look in the case study literature to see how many cases have been published that show, not just in psilocybin, but actually in psychedelics broadly, that would activate um, a manic episode or that there's evidence of this. There's some interesting research out there um, on epidemiological research, as well as studies uh, done with ayahuasca in South America, where, where uh, case studies are looked at to see how many people actually do develop um, either bipolar disorder or get a manic episode activated or psychosis. And what we found was there are definitely cases in the literature, although we were not overwhelmed by them, I think we really expected to find, you know, if not, you know, dozens or hundreds or something of this, it really wasn't that common. And we don't know, of course, is that just because the medical community just thinks that it's so common, they wouldn't write up a case report. There's no way to really know that question. Uh, but there, there are cases of it. It's just not clear to what degree the risk is, is very high. Um, it's very anecdotal and hard to kind of pin down. Um, but Surprisingly, we weren't overwhelmed by the the number, the sheer volume of of the of the uh, case studies that were out there. Now, for people watching who might not be as familiar, can you maybe explain a little bit about what a a case study is and how it might help flesh out our understanding of psychedelics for bipolar disorder, but also what some of the limitations of this type of research might be. Yeah, that's a great question. So what we um, know sometimes is, so a case study is essentially where um, a group of professionals who see a case that either surprises the, the, uh, the um, medical or clinical uh, uh, community in a way that they think would be helpful to sort of write up in this single, single uh, participant uh, or subject or um, treatment um, receiver um, that they can they write up the history of that individual to see essentially what unfolded for that person as a means of understanding either a substance and how it impacted a person or um, maybe some sort of interaction with a medication or a particular treatment or procedure. And so what we found was in, in the literature, you know, most of what we find are examples of this are um, recreational use, almost entirely recreational use of a psychedelic that then seemed to kick off a, a, um, a manic or psychotic episode of some sort that, that was concerning. And so that's really um, what we were interested in looking at, as well as um, cases that might have been in more underground community treatments that involved like psychotherapy assisted um, treatment of a particular um, using using a, psych a psychedelic and psychotherapy together to treat like depression or something like that that created a, a manic episode. Those were I, I don't remember us finding any like that actually that that looked like that. Almost all the examples were of recreational use and of poly substance use and not just taking you know psilocybin but something else at the same time and then something happening after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Dr. Josh Woolley and I were talking about this the other day, you know, that the, the case studies we have 
uh, naturally going to be focused on negative outcomes because people don't present to the um, emergency department when they have a particularly good experience with yeah. psilocybin. Um, but it's still interesting to see the potential risks outlined like that. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There's such a bias in medicine and in clinical psychology to uh, focus on the negative rather than the positive. Although we did actually find one case study I can remember with a, a person who had a long mental health history problem um, that was written up about repeated LSD use where there was some positive outcomes. So it wasn't entirely negative, but of course the case studies are almost entirely focused on negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. Right. And um in, in planning for the clinical trial of um, psilocybin in bipolar depression, I'm wondering, is there research that exists to tell us what the safest and most beneficial dose and usage might be for people with bipolar disorder? Yeah, this is a great question. And so, you know, most of the work, most of the, uh, the, um, the use of psilocybin in the community recreationally is done with mushrooms, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And so the dosage and the amount of psilocin that's actually in the mushrooms themselves varies pretty uh, widely. And so um, in our study and in most clinical trials, we're not using actual mushrooms. We're using um, a pill form of the psilocin itself. And so we can actually uh, really focus on a specific dosage amount. Um, and so we we don't know is the short answer to this, but we are kind of going off of what previous studies have done in terms of for treatment resistant depression and depression itself as a means of figuring out, well, we know this works in, in depression at this particular dosage level. And so we're starting out with, with that um, at a slightly lower dosage for people with um, bipolar Two, um, as a means of, of making sure that you know, this is initially a, a safety trial, right? To make sure that it is safe to um, to to uh, treat bipolar two depression, um, given the concerns that I referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and you've mentioned, you know, that it's a, a safety trial. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about what some of the the risks you might be looking out for and some of the strategies that you are implementing to um, reduce those. Yeah. So, you know, in, in looking at the literature and what people are concerned about, I think obviously mania is the number one concern for this particular population for bipolar 2 disorder. Um, the other concerns that we would just kind of naturally uh, want to pay attention to since depression is in the mix and the people coming into this trial are depressed um, are worsening concerns about suicidality or activation of psychosis. Um, those are really the three, the big three that we're keeping a close eye on. And so we have multiple um, eyes on people, both in terms of um, uh, multiple assessment time points, uh, both pre and post dosing. And then we also uh, require that people coming into the study have a um, caregiver or a partner or a roommate who can kind of also agree to be a part of the study in a, in a small way where they um, just keep an eye on how people are doing after the dosing. And then the third piece that we're looking at is um, we are making sure that people come in with a mental health treatment provider. So somebody that has been working with them for some time. So it's not just coming into a trial and then leaving after, you know, trying this uh, psychotherapy assisted um, psilocybin um, dosage. So it's like, it, it is a kind of a, a lot of different pieces that we want to make sure that um, we're not just um, taking any risks here, that people are, are carefully being um, watched and they're obviously reporting throughout on how they're doing. Right, great. That, that sounds um, very different to some of those recreational experiences that we've heard about in our own research and surveys and, and qualitative interviews. Um, so it will be really interesting to see how outcomes um, look different in some of yeah. those clinical settings. Yeah. yeah, especially with that, you know, that that um, having it being very carefully kind of walked through and and uh, and looking at each of the questions around, you know, suicidality and and um, and mania and, and, and psychosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're also a clinical psychologist, mm -hmm. um, and you know you've talked a bit about how um, psilocybin might involve both these pharmacological effects, but also psychological. And your trial is going to have psychotherapy. So can you tell me a bit more about what role um, that psychotherapy element might play in um, psilocybin-based treatments for bipolar disorder? 
Yeah, this is an area that I'm super excited about. So yeah, I, I am a private practice uh, psychologist. And so just in working with people and thinking about how we deal with treatment resistant depression and other, other psychological issues, I think what's really fascinating is how people set a uh, have a mindset or an intention to work with the substance. So when you talk to the facilitators who are therapists themselves working with people in these trials, they're really looking to tailor the, the approach to what the person needs. It's not just on just let's work on your mood, your low mood. It's also like, what does your low mood mean to you? And I think this is a really powerful part of, a, of the interaction between the substance and the psychotherapy itself. So um, I think that this is a really interesting question in two different ways. One is, I think, how we define depression. And I think it's very ideographic. I think that everyone ha who has depression has depression in a different way. That's how I think as a therapist, and I think that's how most people experience it. It's not really cookie cutter. And so these substances appear to do something where they allow the person to really focus in on that particular thing. Um, th that the meaning of the depression and how they can maybe begin to expand their understanding of their life, their life and their worldview as it relates to depression, but as it relates to getting out of the depression. And the second piece, which we are, um, which may end up happening, although it's not a, a direct um, a association of this particular trial, but we imagine that people who have hypomania may also be concerned about having a manic episode. And because the substance itself activates some hypomania, which is a very common short-term effect of the substance, um, this may lead to some questions about like helping people have a different relationship with increased mood, rather than just seeing it about treating depression. I and mean, initially that's really what our, our trial is focusing on, but I can see that there's something here potentially for exposing people to hypomania in a way that's um, helpful for them, as opposed to feeling you know, concerns about that. And so I, I see that as being another piece where the psychotherapy may be a nice way of um, helping people go through difficult experiences and have a different perspective on those experiences than they did before they went through them. Right, that's that's really fascinating. And it sounds quite similar to some of what we heard in um, our own uh, survey, where um, people were reporting that although some experiences of psilocybin use were really challenging, hmm. um, that it almost helped them learn how to cope with similar um, mental health symptoms that occurred later. You know, the overwhelming experiences that they had during a psychedelic uh, experience um, taught them how to implement coping strategies for anxiety, mm -hmm. psychosis, unusual beliefs, et cetera. Right. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about anything that you know about what the research says about these challenging experiences and how psychotherapy might help people process them. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about the, the research on this. I think this is still in a really an emerging area, but um, you might know some of the things that I, I'm not familiar with in that area. But I, I do think as a therapist, one of the things I do see this being potentially very beneficial is in depression, in um, a number of mental health disorders, there's a way in which people will often personalize things or um, have a particular pathogenic belief, a belief that's kind of harming them in some way that comes back to why is why is my world the way it is? Why am I unhappy in this kind of deep way? Why I don't why I don't have the relationships that I want to have or the job that I want to have or you know why do I not feel connected to my community or whatever it is? And I think what's really fascinating in just in psychotherapy is that we're trying to loosen those beliefs and say, well, maybe there are many contributing factors and you aren't the common denominator. Maybe there are other things that we can loosen up here. And I think that this is really where potentially psychedelics could help us move to in kind of augmenting psychotherapy um, and helping people loosen those beliefs and begin to look at other possibilities or trying different things to make things uh, more flexible for them. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, and I know we're talking here about uh, experiences that might occur during a kind of full threshold psychedelic experience. Um, but I know a, a lot of um, people are interested in microdosing and whether that might have um, similar or different benefits. Um, so can you maybe explain what microdosing is and then comment on the research that you're aware of in that area? Yeah, so microdosing is uh, taking a substance uh, like psilocybin in a dose that is low enough that it's imperceptible. So the person doesn't get a 
uh, a sense of, uh, uh, you know, a, a disconnect with reality or hallucinations or anything like that, but that it may be affecting in some ways the very things that we're talking about, you know, causing some uh, increased neuroplasticity or some sort of response that allows them to have more flexibility. Um, and so I could easily see this being kind of the next direction for um, uh, bipolar disorder or, or bipolar 2, since there's less of a concern of like activating a, a manic episode at a subthreshold dose. Um, uh, there still probably will be some concerns there and probably would require, you know, the safety uh, guardrails that we have in the study that we're doing as well. But I could see that being the, the, the future direction for us or other, other research groups that are looking in this area. Right, interesting. So it would be um, useful to look at whether some of those risks that we've seen in full psychedelic experiences occur in, yeah. in, in microdosing. And in microdosing, because it's a threshold, you don't know whether you've gotten the dose or not. So in clinical trials, it's a little bit easier to randomize people into, you know, a, an inert substance or, um, you know, microdosing psilocybin or something too. So I could see that being, a, that, that is one of the benefits of obviously in the clinical trials that are being done right now with psychedelics, you typically do know whether or not you've had a heavy yeah. dosage of a, of, a, of a psychedelic substance or not. So whereas if it's microdosing, by definition, it should be sub-threshold. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's pretty hard to come up with a placebo for um, psychedelics, for sure. Exactly, exactly, for sure. Right. Um, and what do you think clinical applications of psychedelics will look like in the future? God, you know, I think everyone's still trying to figure this particular question, how it will intersect with mental health as it exists now. Um, I really hope, given... Um, that there's this kind of careful folding in of the benefits that exist for psychotherapy now and sort of the augmented uh, kind of careful um, controlled environments with people um, to help them loosen some of these more pathogenic or, or um, problematic beliefs. I could see that being a very helpful kind of intersection of the two if it's done carefully and it's not too... Um, I don't know, rec nothing goes wrong with necessarily with recreational, but I could see it getting so loose that it's not very helpful. And so I'm hoping that there'll be a nice combination between, I mean, if you think about how psychotherapy is done now, it's effective, it's helpful, um, but sometimes things go slowly. And this may be a way where um, for, for therapy to sort of speed things up for some people, I could see that being the, a, a direction that happens once it's a, a legal substance. Right, because it really seems to get straight to the, the heart of the matter for some people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what I think a lot of people are looking for in, in, in therapy. It's going to be so interesting uh, to learn more in the future about both the, the results of um, your clinical trial for bipolar depression, as well as more fine-grained studies of what this process is, how yeah. much, you know, is pharmacology how much is psychotherapy and then you know for psychologists like you and me how we can best help support that process agreed it's so complicated there's a lot there <laughs> <It's just laughs> yes go ahead it's not going to happen quickly it's going to take some time I think yeah um well I'm sure that you and I could talk for hours kind of exploring the nuts and bolts of that question but uh Thank you so much for the time that you've shared today. Um, and I would love to reach out and hear more about your trial when it's complete. Yeah, be happy to. Thanks so much. Thank Harvey. you so much.